inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lane. My guest on the podcast today is doing something that I think is really interesting. He bought a three-unit building, but he's not house hacking. And a, a lot of people that would buy a building like that would move into one of the units, rent out the other two, and hopefully be able to live there for free. My guest is renting out all three units, and he's a renter himself somewhere else in town. So I want to see why he's doing this and how it's working out. So let's take a real quick break. We'll thank our sponsors. We'll come right back, and we'll meet Steve Torty from Providence. Are you looking for actionable steps to create wealth and passive income? As a top-ranked business and investing podcast with over 800 five-star reviews, the Passive Real Estate Investing Show is packed with strategies and insight for putting money in your pocket. Marco Santarelli from Narada Real Estate Investments brings his expertise and knowledge on both passive and turnkey real estate investing, and he provides listeners with helpful tools and tips to create the wealth you've always wanted. Head over to iTunes or Google Play today and subscribe to Passive Real Estate Investing Podcast or visit PassiveRealEstateInvesting.com. That's PassiveRealEstateInvesting.com. The first step in buying a rental property is to get pre-qualified. And I would suggest you work with a lender that specializes in working with investors because the last thing you want to have happen is to get to closing and find out the money's not there and you can't close. The lender that I recommend is Chaley Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. She's a nationwide lender, and she'll pre-qualify you for free if you mention Rental Income Podcast. Find out more today. Contact Chaley at RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E, LendingGroup.com. NMLS 42056. Hey, Steve, why don't we start with you giving us the, just a real quick Cliff Notes version of your background, just so we can get to know you a little bit better. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I'm Steve. I'm from Providence, Rhode Island. Um, my background has really o- always been in um, in sales and specifically advertising sales. Okay. Um, so I've I've moved around a little bit, but actually primarily uh, billboards, which believe which are pretty close to uh, real estate investing when you look at it. You know, you buy the asset. Um, you know, you rent out the space, which is your tenants and, you know, the advertisers being your tenants and then you depreciate the asset like a house. So it's, it actually kind of has gone back and forth between my real estate investing and what I do full time. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Cause yeah, you're right. It's really kind of the same concept with owning rental properties. So that is a pretty good, yeah. Yeah. The the only problem is that there's uh you know, advertisers instead of tenants that you're right, (laughs) right, right. So, all right. So, so you have today, you have a three unit property. Um, so yep. let, let's kind of talk about like when you decided you wanted to buy a rental property, like how did you decide like what neighborhoods to look at, what type of property you were looking for? Like, how did you kind of figure everything out? Right. So, well, I mean, I know the state very well. It's, a, you know, it's obviously a small state, the smallest, um, that we have. And so I know it very well. I grew up in the, in really the middle of it. So that really wasn't too much of an issue. And here locally, the, the numbers aren't so astronomical like San Francisco or, you know, Boston where it's really hard to get in. So it was really just – and I bought recently. So it was about finding the place that nobody, that not everybody was bidding on. Okay. You know, so I know I didn't want to be in certain areas of Providence where I know I'd always have trouble, especially being my you know, first-time landlord. Um, so I could rule those out just by knowing the market. So, I mean, and I was in investing groups before, you know, I bought and I talked to a lot of people and that sort of thing too. So not only going off of my gut, um, okay. but yeah, I mean, knowing the market. Okay. So w- then you ended up buying a three unit. Did you consider buying a duplex or a fourplex or a single family or was a three unit really kind of your focus? Uh, for me, the any two, three or four, I do not okay. want a single family. It's just... To me, it doesn't make sense. Why I I, I follow? Um, I'm a big Grant Cardone follower, and you know, he, he, if you talk to him, he would say that four is a waste of time. So, <laughs> really, you know, well, he, why does he say that? What? Why does he, he say just, four is a waste? Because he says you know you should be you're saving up a hundred thousand dollars and buying a complex. Um, okay, yeah. For me, that just doesn't make sense. I mean, I think for most people that doesn't. But I'm also, but I like his theory of bring on the debt and put as little money down as possible. Yeah. Um, and, so my, my, I would just wanted to get as big as I could get with 5% down, which was three to four. 
Now, the other thing that you're doing that's, I, I guess, kind of what Grand Cardone preaches is you don't actually live in the unit, where a lot of people we've had on the podcast, they'll buy a three unit, they'll house hack, they'll, they'll live in one of the units and rent out the other two and end up living for free. But you don't actually live at the three unit. You rent the whole thing out and you rent yourself. So is, is right. that kind of inspired by Grand Cardone? Um, yes and no. Um, I probably would have done it you know, even if he, he doesn't say to do that, but for me, because a, I didn't want to live next to the tenants. I just, I want some space between me and them. They've got my Mm -hmm. personal cell number. I come over whenever they need them. I'm still close. Um, but it just made more sense to separate myself. And then on top of it, you know, yeah, I I could live in there and live for free and yeah, I'm spending two or $300 more a month to rent on my own versus where, what I would be sacrificing by living in the property. Mm -hmm. But to me, that two and three hundred dollars is well worth it. Yeah, you know, I have a much nicer place. I'm on my own, um, yeah. so for me, it makes sense. But w- with that in mind, I mean, I understand that I'm spending money on rent. Um, so I, my next move is most likely going to be an owner occupied um, place that you know I could buy on my own. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because that, that's something that I think about a lot. Because for the house that that I live in, I could rent a property in this neighborhood cheaper than what my right. mortgage payment is. So it's... Well, it's, that's the other thing too. It's, it's yeah, you know, a lot of people, my family and friends always tell me that, well, what, you know, why are you doing that? You're spending more money renting than you could just live in your own house. But it's it's not. I mean, right. I know now from firsthand experience how much it costs to run a house. Right. You know, yep. so I mean, if, if I'm going to buy something on my own or buy a condo or whatever, I mean, there's a lot of stuff every month that comes up. And with this, it's just the, the rent payment, you know, right. That's, right. That's what, that's what I owe them. I call them when something's broken and I worry about my own property. So how has it been working out with working full time and then dealing with three tenants? Has it taken up a lot of your time or has it gotten in the way of, of living your life? Uh, no. So, I mean, I use my backgrounds in sales, like I said, so I'm on the road a lot. If I need to stop over there for something, I can do it. But most of the time they understand I come by on the weekends, I do the grass, I do the maintenance. Um, and then if they have anything for me, they tell me then. So, I mean, it really hasn't been anything that's too big of a deal. I mean, with that said though, if, if there's a, you know, a, a screen door or something that needs to be replaced, I do hire somebody. So they come by during the okay. day and do it. Yeah. Um, but that's, you know, small compared to everything. Tell me know, about this property. Things. Cause it, it seems like you got a, a, a great property. So you've, you've created $40,000 in equity by basically fixing the property up, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so when I got it, um, it was actually owned by this company, Gateways to Change. Uh, if they're in your area, look them up because <laughs> they uh, they get um, they get some government funding. They they had bought this property for two hundred and sixty or eighty thousand, I think, right at the height of the market, and then I bought it for one seventy. So they actually had to come up with money just to sell it. Okay, and. They're, because they're funded by the government, they just decide, okay, this property's gone, we're going to list it, and they don't really care what hit they take. Oh, so nice. it, it was, if, you know, look them up, and they do a great service too. I mean, they, they house people that have some mental issues but can still live on their own. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that's what this house was. And, and on top of that, that actually scared some people away. It just was a, it wasn't, when I walked in, I was, I was like, oh, I don't know about this, but that's why everybody ran away. And, I reached out to a family friend that was an agent and also did some renting, um, some investing. And he was like, buy this. And I was like, you sure? And he's like, yeah, buy this. And I'm like, I ran the numbers and I'm like, all right, he's right. So I bought it and then I added two bedrooms. Um, so there was two laundry rooms in the building, which didn't make any sense. Yeah. So I made those both bedrooms. And then, uh, you know, just by putting up a wall, it really wasn't that complicated. I mean, I don't have really any background in um carpentry or anything but it was easy enough to do um so put up a wall in there you know cut a a hole in the the wall for a door downstairs um and then all of a sudden there's two extra bedrooms put a new roof on it cleaned it up painted it um fixed the fence and you know they came by and with an appreciating market you know it gave me forty thousand. so now, that was less than a year. Did you get um like contractor estimates before you bought the property or did you buy it and and just knew that you were going to be able to make things work um well i mean i didn't have a number in mind in terms of how much equity i wanted that was just bonus okay so i mean i knew roughly that it would be about ten thousand for the roof and the gutters and that was obviously the biggest expense Mm -hmm. um and the other stuff i just 
you know, set some money aside, do the work on my own, and okay, I can I could have made it work. So yeah, so I you, mean, I, but I the, like I said, the the equity was bonus. I mean, yeah, it was just right. like, hey, can this can this thing make money month to month? You know. So the, yeah, let's talk about some of the numbers. All right, so what's your mortgage payment every month? It's eleven thirty four. That does not include taxes. Though. Okay. Oh, I'm and sorry, insurance. I pay that separate. The taxes and insurance, or just just the, the insurance. Okay. So. Yeah, and there's the other thing too is because the roof was bad when I bought it, they didn't, they wouldn't put me. This is the other thing to look at. They wouldn't put me at a regular insurance rate. They wanted to go, uh, they call it a Rhode Island joint reinsurance, which basically is just more expensive. So it's actually twenty eight hundred dollars a year right now. Okay. Okay. So I've got to get that down. But so if you figure it all in, actually doing the math right now. Uh, yeah. So two thirty three. Right. So we're about thirteen hundred. Okay, thirteen hundred, and then. How much do the units rent out for? So the three bedroom is eleven hundred, and that one's section eight. Okay. Um, and then the two bedroom is ten twenty five, and the one bedroom is eight fifty. Awesome. So, okay. Yeah. So twenty nine seventy five a month coming in. Twenty nine seventy five coming in, and, and tell me again what you said the mortgage payment was with everything with taxes. Thirteen hundred. Thirteen hundred. Okay. So you're doing great there. That. Yeah. 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 That is awesome. Now, after the, buying this, you've owned this for how long? About a year? Is it? Yeah, just over okay. a year. So, and, yeah. so, and how has it been dealing with the tenants? Like, have you had any problems or has there been any turnover or has anything gone wrong? So the only thing, um, th- there hasn't been any turnover. I've been really lucky there. A lot of people, they're weary about the Section 8, but she has been great. I mean, she just needs it. You know, she's in a position where she needs the help. Mm-hmm. And it's not, uh, you know, it's nothing against, um, you know, her personally or anything. So she's been a phenomenal tenant, actually the best one. Um, so, so you've it, got, it is a mix. You've got one Section 8 tenant and then two just regular cash tenants. Yeah, exactly. Why did you do Good. that as, as opposed to going all cash tenants or all Section 8 tenants? So, the well, upstairs was the – is that's the Section 8 um, tenant with a three-bedroom. And um, I just figured, hey, if I can get this money guaranteed as a new investor, that's going to make a ton of sense for me. Right. So I basically, in my mind, kind of uh, anchored the property, right, with a Section 8 tenant because that's a direct deposit. Oh, so yeah. I said, all right, that's I good. This house, right? I'm looking at this thing. <laughs> like, I got to fix all of this stuff. I got a mortgage payment due, and I don't know what I'm doing, right? So I basically just went upstairs and said, all right, I'm going to put this wall up. I'm going to clean this place out. I'm going to get it lead certified, and I'm going to get my money guaranteed from the city. Right. Right. So then I'm like, okay, once that's all set, I mean, that basically covered the mortgage. So right. Like, okay, I can breathe. So that $1,100 right. $1, is guaranteed to me, uh, or most of it. Yeah. And then that I'm really. Like, now I can, Go. Let me make sure everyone understands that because that's really smart. So you you've got her eleven hundred dollars a month rent coming in that gets direct deposited from the city, and then you've got yes. your mortgage payment of of eleven thirty four. So basically, your mortgage payment is covered by the Section Eight, and then the other two cash paying tenants. That's basically your expenses, your your insurance, whatever exactly. else, your profit. That that's that's great. That's actually really a great way to do it. Yeah, it really, and it made a ton of sense. And, it, and she, you know, you're help, you feel like you're helping somebody out a little bit. And, yeah. Um, you know, it, so it, it worked out. And, and yeah, like I said, once I got that rented, I kind of was like breathing easy. Cause I'm like, I know, you know, the bank will always, you know, have you buy the house based off of your personal income. So it's like, all right, I know I can afford it, but I, you know, that's kind of a lot all right. of a sudden to take on as an expense. And so in your head and you're just like looking at this building and you're like, I guess this is mine. Right. So, right. 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 <laughs> right. Just got to get it filled, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I guess it, you know, if worse came to worse, I mean, if it ended up being that it was a nightmare, I mean, you, you might not want to, but like you always could move in there and you could exactly. personally just pay the mortgage. So like there, there's not a lot of risk there, I, I don't feel. Now, tell me this with with the Section 8 tenant, a lot of people are afraid of Section 8 because you hear the stories about how the Section 8 tenant destroys the property or they're really rough on it. Have you found that to be true or has your Section 8 tenant been a, uh, just the same as your other cash paying tenants? Yeah, she's, she's been – like I said, she's my best tenant. And okay. the, yeah. uh, the other reason I did that was because – look at your state to find out – or your city and find out what the situation is with demand for the vouchers, the Section 8 vouchers. 
because there's a three year waiting list here in Cranston, and they will they do not want to be back on that waiting list because they don't have the money to pay rent. So she goes out of her way to make sure that I'm happy, just because if I report that she's not paying, you know, her portion of it, or she's damaging the property, that sort of thing, she knows that she's going to lose that voucher. Right. Um. It's it 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 really keeps them more you know one of your best tenants right so did you do any kind of screening on her or did you just assume because she's approved by section eight and that that's a uh, a big long process that she's been through to to get approved that she and and also that the money's guaranteed did you just accept her based on being approved by section eight or did you do any other background check so I did the background check, but nothing with the credit. Okay. Um, so, she, I mean, she, you know, she did show me her income and that yeah. sort of thing. But I did the background check. You know, obviously, I showed her the apartment and everything and, you know, felt like I could trust her and everything's been good so far. So, How about getting approved for Section 8? Because I, I, a lot of times in, I think, just about every area, they, they have inspections and they might ask for the things to be fixed. W- was that a, a complicated process, getting, getting through that? Um, the, the hardest part was the lead inspection. Uh, the, the, I mean, the requirements for section eight are, they're, they're pretty lenient. Um, I mean, obviously simple stuff, make sure there's a window, two exits, you know, an outlet in every bedroom, that sort of thing. The lead inspection was the hardest because, and this was probably because of of how naive I was, but, uh, sanded all the floors. And the second you do that, all of the lead dust gets kicked up everywhere. Mm, <laughs> right? Right. So I didn't know that. So I sanded all the floors down. I'm going through and thinking I'm getting this all nice and everything. And then they they tell me, um, you know, when you sand, all of that lead dust that's in the floor is going to get on the ceilings. I'm like, ugh. So I'd go through. I had to make sure everything was clean anyway. Right. But I really went through and then I still failed. I mean, I hired somebody to clean. I cleaned myself. And then uh, I still failed, right? So wow. I was like, I called, I said, what do you want me to do here? <laughs> They're like, go through. And they, um, they, gave me, they gave me a tip for this. Um, and now I forget it, but it's a certain type of cleaner. Oh, what was the name of it? C- not CLR, but it was three letters. I'll see if I can think of it. But, okay. um, but anyway, I had to go through with this special type of cleaner to get the lead off. And then it finally passed. So that was, that was the biggest struggle. But Wow. Uh, other than that, you know, really not too bad. The requirements aren't anything ridiculous. So how how could someone avoid that in the future? Is it better to not sand the floors or do you want to just make sure you you hire that special cleaner after you sand? I, well, I would uh, – if you're going to do the floors, you hire somebody with the right – you know, the HEPA vacuums. Okay. Uh, that has the right equipment for the lead. So me just doing it on my hands and knees just made it go everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are there are systems that they have to you know capture the dust before it goes you know spreads. Yeah, um, that's a good. You know, that's have. really a good thing to to think about because you, you're yeah. right. I mean that, that that I'm sure that was a nightmare to get through that. So where do you see yourself going from from here? I mean you, you've had a great start. Um, th- this property is working out great for you. Do you see yourself buying more properties? Yeah, absolutely. So um, my next. I actually in the the funny thing too, just a little background, I guess, on New England if you're not familiar. So Rhode Island is it's about fifty miles south of Boston. It's kind of known that if you're in Rhode Island you get paid a little bit less, but the living cost of living is way less. Mm-hmm. So I got an offer on a job at a job in Boston and you know, then I'm like, all right, how can I make this work? I wanna do this, you know, big city, good money, all that stuff. So I in my head I was like, All right, well let's go back to the real estate stuff. That's my, my end goal, right? So you go in and you say, all right, I can't get they're, – they're telling me in Rhode Island I can't buy another multi-unit without 25% down because then, then I'm an investor and not a person buying a house. Mm-hmm. So I looked out and said, all right, if I can get a three, four unit outside of Boston, um, obviously with low money down because it's very expensive up there, if I can do that and live for free – then this is the hack, right? This is the hack right. that makes it work. I can make the more money in Boston. I can buy another property and still live rent free. So that's really my next yeah. my next move. I did get pre-approved because this mortgage was conventional that I have. They're actually letting me do an FHA. That's great. So, so three and a half percent I, down. I, yeah, three and a half yeah. percent down. Yeah. Um, so that this this makes a ton of sense. And again, yeah. I mean, once I'm doing that. I kind of think if you're following the two percent rule, which I know you know some people hate, some people love, um, if you can get to a million in 
property value that, you know, you're collecting enough to, to live on your own, you know, to live without a job pretty much. Right. Well, well, Steve, thank you so much for coming on the show. If someone wants to look you up, or are you on social media or is there a way people can find you? Yep. So uh, my Instagram, probably my Instagram or Twitter, it's all just at Steve Torty. Okay. So Steve, uh, T-O-R-T-I. And then I do have a website that's kind of in progress that I'm using for um, – you know, uh, some advertising stuff I do as well as uh, real estate. I, I would love to get into wholesaling. It's just, that's a whole nother, yeah. um, you know, that's a whole nother time commitment. So I've got some stuff on there for it, but it's just stevetorty.com. If you want to look that up later on, I've got a link to Steve's contact information on my website. You can find it at rentalincomepodcast.com slash episode 207. If you are looking to buy a rental property, whether you're just getting started and looking for one of your 10 golden tickets where you're going to get the best rates and the best terms, or if you're an experienced investor, you've got a bunch of properties and you want to grow your portfolio, the lender that I recommend is Chaley Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. She specializes in doing rental property loans, so she can definitely help you out no matter where you are in your journey. You can find out more at RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E, LendingGroup.com, NMLS42056. If you need to book a car rental, but you don't want to spend hour after hour searching for the best rate possible, I want to let you know about a website that's totally free and will save you a ton of time and money. It's called Autoslash.com. The way it works is you go onto Autoslash, you submit your car rental information, when you need the car, where you need the car, and Autoslash gets to work and they will search hundreds of different discount codes and promotions and give you the lowest rate possible. You'll get an email back and it, it will show you all the different car rental agencies and what their best rate is and give you instructions on how you can make the reservation. What's great is that Autoslash continues to work after you've made your reservation. They continue to check the internet, looking for new promotions, looking for new discount codes. And if they find you a better rate, they're going to email you and let you know that you can cancel the first reservation with no penalty and rebook at the lower rate. It's really an incredible service. Autoslash is dedicated to saving you money. And the best part about it, it's totally free. You can check it out today. Just go to autoslash.com. That's A-U-T-O-S-L-A-S-H, autoslash.com. Thank you so much for listening and subscribing to the podcast. We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday. My name is Dan Lane, and this has been the Rental Income Podcast.